As the Money Burns is an original podcast by Nikki Woodard. Based on historical research, this is a deep exploration into what happened to a set of actual heirs and heiresses to some of America's most famous fortunes when the Great Depression hit. Each episode has three primary sections. Section 1 is a narrative story. Section 2 goes deeper into the historical facts. Section 3 focuses on contemporary, emotional, and personal connections. Story Recap Cobina Wright loses her home and moves into the Waldorf while Louise Van Allen divorces her longtime love, Prince Alexis Devani. Now back to As the Money Burns. All of this fuss. With a large fortune in sight, a whole family gathers to determine the next set of moves. What is an heiress to do? Section 1, Story December 1932, Paris Less than a week after the Russian prince Alexis Devani and Princess Louise Van Allen Devani's divorce, the Devani clan of five siblings gather for a conference in Paris. At the head is the eldest sibling, Princess Nina Devani Uberich, her husband, Charles Uberg, has successfully unentangled youngest sibling, Alexis, from his heiress first wife with a rumored $1 million settlement, a little less than $22.5 million in 2023. This hefty settlement dwarfs all the other Divani prospects, but that isn't going to stop them from wanting more. Ever a playboy, Alexis is taking his time and likely a little lackadaisical as he also entertains the very beautiful Baroness Von Von Thiessen, a young, sexy lady born Elsa Zars married recently to a much older gentleman, Baron von Thiessen, on August 29, 1932. Their marriages didn't prevent either the prince nor the baroness from cavorting around with each other. Still, the daring and ruggedly handsome Alexis and his calculating siblings have sights on an even bigger prize, the chubby budding fashionista Barbara Hutton. Her inheritance dwarfs Louise as nearly double in size, and Barbara will turn 21 later in 1933, making it all under the domain of her future husband. Nina has always been the planner in the family involving logistics, while sister Princess Rusadana Rusi Sertivani is better at the seduction and manipulation. Rusi has been entertaining and learning every bit of Barbara's vulnerabilities and knows exactly how to win her over. Brothers Prince Sergei Divani and Prince David Divani are semi-obedient soldiers who have added mystique and intrigue to the family name and earning the moniker the Marrying Divanis, as they seduce and marry wealthy entertainers, whose coffers deplete rather quickly and unexpectedly under the Divani's largest needs. Funny how once impoverished beggars expect and demand such lavish lifestyles. But now, Alexis has a chance at the big prize, a big dame hunter in his own right, Alexis is going after the biggest prize of all. The only relatively close and larger heiress is none other than the tall and now less awkward Doris Duke. Only Doris seems somewhat immune to Divani charms and is very much monitored by her mother, Nanaline Duke. Besides, another admirer, James H.R. Cromwell, a.k.a. Jimmy, is staking his claim on her. And his uber-rich mother, Ava Stotesbury, and stepfather, E.T. Stotesbury, along with Hope Diamond owner Evelyn Wash McLean, are colluding in that pursuit. Ironically, unknown to virtually everyone, the depleting Stotesbury fortune has made Doors a much-needed target of seduction by that family, too. Meanwhile, the Devonis plan a full-on seductive assault on Barbara, playing to her interest, insecurities, and vulnerabilities. Already, Alexis and Barbara have been exchanging letters for years, he knows her intimate fears and frustrations. She already sees him as her best friend and closest confidant. By mid-December 1932, Alexis promptly boards the ocean liner Beringia and arrives a few days later in New York City after Barbara's arrival and his divorce. As he descends the gangplank, he is greeted by Barbara's social secretary who informs him that he will not be seeing Barbara on this trip. He will stay at the Savoy Plaza Hotel. Relentless and unwilling to be thwarted, 
Every day at 6 o'clock sharp, Alexis appears on the Fifth Avenue doorstep of the Hutton townhome, only to be refused entry or access to Barbara. Inside the townhome with views of Central Park, Barbara faces down her father, Franklin Hutton, and stepmother, Irene Hutton. Franklin is determined not to let the immense fortune he has nearly doubled to be wasted by a spendthrift Dibani. Franklin and Irene do not understand Barbara's obsession with royalty, and in particular, this set that seems so trashy. Barbara herself has been sporting a large ruby ring on her finger, one that everyone notices and suspects might be an engagement ring. She dismisses their concerns. She offers to take Irene shopping on another jewelry expedition to Cartier's. Barbara regularly buys Irene expensive gifts as she has learned that is the best way to get along or otherwise will get the silent treatment. Delightedly, Irene expects this weekly ritual with greedy, salivatory anticipation. Irene is more like an envious stepsister than a motherly figure. Always keeping track tit for tat, whatever Barbara gets, she must have too, or otherwise feels unfairly deprived. For solace, Barbara seeks in private her longtime French governess and surrogate mother, Germaine Tiki Toquet. To Tiki, Barbara confesses all, and they will regularly reread Alexis's letters and dissect them. The only other true confidant allowed into the townhome is Barbara's cousin, James Jean Donahue, slightly younger and gay. Jean gladly indulges Barbara in her fantasies, but he also warns her about the Divani's penchant for overspending. Jean also encourages Barbara to have fun with other males. Back in the States and with so much scandal surrounding the newly divorced Prince Alexis, Barbara hopes to have a less problematic love affair. She reaches out to her former Yale beau, but he is still reluctant to marry into wealth and would rather scrape by on his scholarship. Another friend, Winston Guest, to whom she gifted a bejeweled cigarette case, regularly appears at her events. Then there's the charming and handsome James Blakely. This Park Avenue lad is definitely fun, attentive, and so devoted to her. She even bought him a nice pair of diamond evening studs. But alas, Barbara doesn't feel the pull of undeniable attraction. She has by now tasted the Divani seduction, and it is so hard to settle for less. Though Barbara is fully aware her chubby figure is no match for the lithe Sylvia, her best friend, and Alexis's true and forbidden love. However, Barbara fears people will only want her for her money, so she entertains the notion that Alexis is at least a dear friend and would give her an exciting and adventurous life. As Barbara goes about, her limousine is swarmed from place to place. Reporters constantly approach her and ask her about Alexis. She brushes them off and replies, Oh dear, no. I was afraid all this fuss about an engagement would come up again if he came to New York. That's why I telephoned him before he left Europe. These men. After a few weeks and several more attempts, Alexis has to accept that this courtship for the moment is a no-go. He packs up and sails back to Paris. But don't think the fight is over. Nope. There just has to be a change in tactics. First up, he calls his former wife, Louise Van Allen. Oh, yes. Still in love desperately with Alexis, Louise is all too vulnerable to his pleas. Even worse, she has never closed their joint bank account. And Alexis is dipping into it heavily. It is focused to woo Barbara. The course of love never does run smooth. Not even gold, diamonds, or large bank accounts will ever change that. Section 2, History and Historiography The purpose in studying history is to learn from the past, an important method of understanding how our world is shaped and the whys behind it. This is ever more important in that history often repeats itself. Much of human behavior is constant and relative and thus patterns and their outcomes can be foreseen within some predictable range. While events might never be exact replicas, there are important lessons to be learned and applied today. The Chesterton Fence Principle presents that it is important that reform or change should not be made until the reason behind a current state is understood. 
otherwise so doing would unleash unintended consequences that were being prevented. In essence, such as a decision to remove what seemed like an arbitrary fence should not be made unless the reason for the fence has been ascertained. This concept or principle can also be applied to the importance of learning history and especially the importance in not overcorrecting or reinterpreting history to suit current political and social rules. Now, naturally, any time we revisit a historical topic, we will be influenced by our modern circumstances. Even this podcast is now becoming part of a historical record, and as such, historiography could be applied to it as well. Historiography is the practice of reviewing the source of a historical writing with its biases, whether intentional or not. This podcast was developed by an individual, me, who has a deep love of social history combined with a personal life that felt very parallel to certain situations I or those around me had experienced, mainly dealing with the nature of death and its impact on young and burgeoning adults, as well as the perpetual search for love and meaning and purpose, and how that search leads to many roadblocks and heartbreak the examination of perception and misperception, especially when it comes to envy. I have tried heavily to study history in hopes of somewhat predicting the future from the past and therefore prepare for the random trials of life. But in this story, I find another connection, one to my own feelings and parallel experiences. It's not so much as a warning as a need to understand and relate. Of course, I embellish the tales and people as to how I perceive similar instances and occurrences to get down to the emotional dynamics where we all become vulnerable, where we are all likely to repeat the same mistakes. We all share many of the same struggles, maybe at different times and in different ways, but still at the core, we as humans strive for something more and better. It's hardwired into us. It's so easy to think that money is the solution to everything. And oh, it definitely can help a lot, especially if you're staring at a mortgage, car repair, or something else where dollars or another currency is needed. However, that attitude overlooks where money can't help. It won't quell insecurities. It won't give you the mental fortitude to do physical and emotional challenges. In fact, often those with money might be very weak in those areas. This podcast examines those similarities, those differences, and their challenges. As well, affecting the writing and interpretations, we are collectively going through a world-altering time, much like the Great Depression itself. We live in an era of hard struggle and survival. How this evolved is still a bit confusing. I can look back at other eras, and I am still puzzled by the breadth of societal issues colliding all at once. However, the broad range of problems also leaves us all vulnerable and hopefully a little more ready to empathize where we once were a little too insular. I myself am really wanting to re-explore familiar older topics in other areas to understand the psychology more behind the Salem witch trials, the Inquisition, and other long-ranging hysterias in wanting to find a way out of our current collective mindsets. The current streak in thefts and other lawlessness harkens back to the Prohibition gangster era and the outlaws of the Great Depression. Only are we going to lionize and Robin Hood them as well? The wealth in the story provides for fun and beautiful settings, ups the stakes in some circumstances, alleviates the trivial and petty issues in others, and, well, as always, there was enough public obsession that things were heavily documented. We have a strong collection of information into a group to provide decent insight and conjecture. Additionally, their whole life story played out before I ever learned of each individual, the gift of hindsight being 2020. Many of these fortunes being told have unenviable endings, a stark reminder that what appears from a distant surface is not the same up close. Today, we also experience things differently. Our social media and modern life with so much photograph and video, we are exposed to many more perspectives and in seemingly real time. We understand the horrors and terrors of a mob, and we really know how much farther it can go. And yet, we haven't seen the full cycle in our own lives. We have no idea how long or how much worse things will get before it comes to an end. And things will change inevitably, but when is yet to be determined. So it helps to have a roadmap for hope. Even if it doesn't mark the path and destination clearly, 
it can still guide us to better times. Much of what we learn in this podcast is going to be the opposite. The prevalent mindsets, how or why certain choices are made, the unintended consequences, the failure to adapt, how things don't work out, how things do go wrong. And hopefully, by that, we can learn what not to do, or at least have some compassion when we or those close to us fall into the same pits. This is the intention and purpose of these tales. Highly personal, lives retold from a distant past but relevant to us today. Even for myself, I have experienced and re experienced many of the themes in our stories. And while telling this story, death, heartbreak, financial insecurity, it's making my life a bit of a struggle, but also reinvigorates my desire to tell these tales. These tales were always born from my own broken heart and dreams as I try to forge ahead to an unknown and not sure ever guaranteed better times. Which brings us back to love relationships, personal dreams, and ambitions, the core of who we are at our most basic human desires. And if you still think it is trivial, it should be noted, wealthy or not, it is the heart that can leave us vulnerable one way or another. The number one fraud committed today is the love and romance scam, in all its many splendid forms, probably dwarfs the others because what is known is only the tip of the iceberg. The internet makes this type of scam even far more prevalent. According to a preliminary crime report by the FBI's Internet Crime Complaint Center, it is reported that $739,030,292 U.S. dollars were lost to romance scammers in 2022. The FTC, Federal Trade Commission, estimates $1.3 billion in U.S. dollars as the likely cost for 70,000 people. In 2022, people report paying the scammers via bank transfers 14% of the time, cryptocurrency 15% of the time, and via gift cards 24% of the time. 60% of the amount paid to these scams happening mostly over bank transfers and cryptocurrency being a bigger target. So it is not only the wealthy who are vulnerable to those who target wallets through the heart. I hope you enjoy the journey. We are only halfway into our story and so much more to go. Yes, that means at least 100 plus more episodes if I keep this pace with the timeline. Over the years, I mapped out key points, then continued the discovery and side trips along the way to flesh out a time, place, world, and people so that we just don't know their lives, but experience a taste of it too. We might not know where our lives are heading in the present, but here is a past that provides clear warning signs of darker times, and then as time moves on, the hope that this too shall pass. Section 3, Contemporary and Personal Relevance. This is episode 100. Can you believe we made it this far? And guess what? There's at least 100 more episodes to go. Yes, that's right. I have just as much story left to tell as I have already told. That means more seduction, betrayal, and bad behavior to come. It hasn't just been fun for me to tell the story, but I immensely enjoy those who reach out and contribute their observations, experiences, and curiosities. Previously, we learned Barbara's early suitor, the dangerous playboy Phil Plant, disfigured a chorus girl, who so happened, as one listener pointed out, to be the mother of the Batman and Robin original TV series Catwoman, Julie Newmar. Well, our story has another Batman tie. The handsome Park Avenue lad James Blakely will work as editor for that TV series and eventually become an established television producer in due time. Over the years, a few listeners have reached out to tell me some of their own stories. One explained how listening to an episode on a family vacation led to an exploration into his family history as his Danish grandmother was an heiress who befriended another American heiress, Belle Barouche, whose brother and father recur in the periphery of our story. Another recent listener has reached out from the Middle East and recounted his own personal history and the rise and fall and rise again in a family fortune, as well as an amusing interaction he had on vacation when he met a Divani female cousin who did not speak too highly of her distant relations, even labeling them as selfish. 
Through several online communities, I have met and been told about interactions with those featured in our stories. One pointed out Huntington Harvard and his contributions and efforts after I sounded a little too harsh in my evaluation. My actual intention was criticizing his mother's haughty, superior attitude. On a different discussion, an Astor descendant confirmed one of my comments and observation on a thread about Titanic casualty, John Jacob Astor IV, and his son, Vincent Astor. Then there was another who got interested in a tennis episode and relayed how as a young man he once had drinks with James Henry Van Allen, more popularly known as Jimmy. Others have reached out as they explore the various people and topics I cover. James Jim Donahue, also known in his day as Jimmy, brought another to this podcast. Some have sought advice on books for better exploration. Other opportunities brought me to other podcasts to discuss the wealth, the Great Depression, and the history and lessons involved. I love the overlaps both with actual people related to the story and in general. We are in some way connected more than we realize, even if not directly, then in spirit, nature, and overall humanity. I hope this podcast encourages that feeling of connection. Thanks for being on this journey with me, and let's see where our world will go as we continue these tales. Once again on this road to 100, the one constant companion has been past perfect vintage music, a wonderfully digitally restored music collection from the 1920s, 1930s, and 1940s. Albums feature music from Duke Ellington, Noel Coward, Glenn Miller, and so much more. I can't imagine having this series without the musical elements for each section. Want to hear something even more exciting? Past Perfect Vintage Radio channel can come directly to your home. The daily schedule based in the UK time zone is Vintage Mornings, Long Lunch, an hour along with World War II songs, followed by All That Jazz, a tea time show, Noel's nightly interlude with Noel Coward, then showtime from musicals and movies with lots of Fred Astaire, lastly love songs, then vintage music after dark. It can be simple as asking Amazon's Alexa to turn on Past Perfect Vintage Radio. Also available on TuneIn Radio and MyTuner Radio apps. For more information, check out www.pastperfect.com backslash radio or www.pastperfect.com. Links in the notes and transcript. If you enjoy As the Money Burns, then please share, like, and subscribe. Next, when we return to As the Money Burns, an heiress receives a special award for all her efforts to help the less fortunate, but her good deeds aren't as helpful for her marriage. Until then... As the Money Burns is an original podcast written, produced, and voiced by Nikki Woodard based on historical research. Archival music has been provided by Past Perfect Vintage Music. Check out their website at www.pastperfect.com. Please come visit us at As the Money Burns via Good Pods, X, formerly Twitter, Facebook, or now Meta, and Instagram. Transcripts, timeline, episode guide, and character bios are available at asthemoneyburns.com. <laughs>